that tells me is that uh, folks are all wanting to change. They're all wanting to get in shape. They're all wanting to do this, do that. They're wanting to, you know, make New Year's resolutions. I'm going to cut back on this. I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to do better at this. I'm going to not do that, whatever it may be. But uh, the it's really not that new for me because, I mean, I, I, make a new, I make a weight loss resolution every couple of weeks. And so uh, the new year, I don't really have any great sweeping thing I'm going to do this year that I hadn't already been been attempting to do, but most people never keep the promises they make, whether it's to themselves or whatever. They don't never keep their resolutions. They don't never keep their, that's why we, that's why we have, that's why every, every new year, you know, you got things, I'm going to do this. I'm, and most of the time, not always, but most of the time you don't keep them. You don't do them. And, and that can be, that can be discouraging Especially when, I mean, that, that's why most people, a lot of people don't do it anymore. That's why I didn't make any resolution because I done the last five, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 years make a resolution. I'm going to do it. I do good for a few weeks and then you don't keep it. You don't do it. And so what it shows me, what it shows us is that we're weak folks. We're weak folks. We're sinful folks. And when it comes, let's just, I mean, eating's kind of my thing. That's where I'm, that's where I fall short all the time. And so we'll just talk about that for a minute. You probably got your thing too. I'm sure you do. But when it comes to, when it comes to eating, you know, I'm pretty selfish kind of guy, pretty, pretty sinful kind of guy because I, you know, when that, I know, I know when something good gets put in front of me, I want to eat it until I'm just sick. I mean, sick and bloated and ugh. And then as soon as I'm full, I go on a diet. I'm, I'm full. I'm going to go on a diet. I'm good. It's not going, we're not going to worry about it. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to start. And then when I get hungry again, I'm like, well, you know, I, I'm going to start tomorrow. Now, all y'all know me. You know, I, I start tomorrow. It's a lot of tomorrows. I, I'm starting. Starting a new diet, whatever. Uh, you know, you can make up your mind about anything. And you can decide, you can be determined. Reminds me of the man that was hitting on the dashboard, you know. You, you can make up your mind about anything. I've made up my mind about lots of things. And you can find yourself right back in it before the day's out. Because you're sinful, and I'm sinful, and my heart's, are wick, my heart's wicked. It seems to me, I'm, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. I'm sorry, I hadn't told you that yet. Uh, and very familiar passage, but it seems to me that we have a memory problem. It's not that we can't remember nothing, because we remember exactly what we want to remember. That's not, it's not that we can't remember. It's that we tend, I'm talking spiritual now, I'm not talking about diets and resolutions. We tend to remember the things that we're supposed to forget, and we tend to forget the things that we're supposed to remember. And so we have this problem, this memory problem. We, we remember what we're supposed to remember always, what we're supposed to remember on a daily basis, what we're supposed to remember as we walk through this life, as we uh, interact with each other, as we interact with God, as we, we develop our relationship with him. We're supposed to remember that we're absolutely worthless without him. We're absolutely sinful and wretched and horrid. And, you know, you, you can't come up with enough adjectives to describe how bad our hearts are. It says desperately, desperately wicked. Genesis 6 says that God looked down and he saw that, that every desire of the imagination of their hearts was evil all the time. I mean, you can't, you can't, I can't overemphasize how wicked we are. That's something we're supposed to remember. But we're also supposed to remember that Christ has made us perfect in himself. He, he was not wicked. He kept the law perfectly. He never sinned against his father. He never did anything that would uh, cause him to have a, a blemish on his account, a blemish on his record as he stands before the father. Uh, he could stand there, the perfect lamb of God, and he could stand in our place, interceding for us, show, giving us what we could not attain for ourselves, giving us that righteousness, giving us that perfection. And so we know that we are sinful. We know that our hearts are wicked, but it doesn't lead us 
to despair. It doesn't lead us to uh, depression. It doesn't lead us to say, woe is me and hang my head because Jesus has given us perfection. He's given us a righteousness that we didn't earn, that we didn't deserve. Those are things that we're supposed to remember. We're supposed to remember those on a daily basis. We're supposed to remember the depths from which God has brought us from. We're supposed to remember the horrible pit that we were in, the sin that we were in, the lost condition that we were in. We're supposed to remember those things. And we're also supposed to remember uh, where God has brought us to, that we have all spiritual blessings in Christ, that we're seated in heavenly places in Christ, that we have all things uh, that are promised to us in Christ, all the promises of God or yay and amen. We're supposed to remember those things. And then there's some things we're supposed to forget as well. We're supposed to forget all the good things that I think that I've done. We're supposed to forget all the things that the world would say, wow, that's really good. You're a good person. You're such a good person. You're, you're, you're a whole lot better than your neighbor. You're a whole lot better than, than uh, whoever, you know, the person down the road. You're, a whole, you're doing really, really good. You're, we're supposed to forget those things. That's what Paul's going to say here in just a minute. He's going to say, forgetting what's behind. I'm going to press forward. And so we're supposed to forget not just the, we're supposed to forget the sin that you did yesterday. I know that's, that's kind of strange sounding, isn't it? We're supposed, if you're a believer in Christ, Holy Spirit indwelled, yesterday's gone. You, I, 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 my, my little favorite saying is, uh, me and Dana have this deal where <clears throat> when something happens, something goes wrong, she loves to play the I told you so game, and I do too. You know, I'll say, you know, instead of saying, you got a problem, here's the problem, rather than saying, okay, I, What's the solution? Let's move forward. Let's find the solution. Let's say, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm talking about not a big problem, just like, you know, the washing machine broke or whatever. You know, I told y'all, I told you that you shouldn't be putting stuff, that kind of stuff in the washing machine. I'm like, well, well, thank you. That's not really going to help now. I don't have a time machine. I can't go in back in time and, and and fix it. What are we going to do now? Paul's saying, look, I'm going to forget all those things that, that I did before. And I'm going to press on to the goal. Now, that's a good thing. That's a good feeling, isn't it? When I say forget all the sin that that happened yesterday, forget all your failures that you did in 2015, forget all the things that that uh, didn't go right, forget all the things that that uh, maybe you regret, maybe shouldn't have happened, maybe, you know, maybe things that you were lazy in, maybe things that you didn't do right. You, You can forget all those things if you are in Christ Jesus. You can forget all those things if the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you can press on to the mark of the high calling. You can press on for the goal. That's a wonderful truth. And I'm sure we can all agree that that's a great thing to say, you know what? You're right. The past is the past and I'm just going to have to move forward. But more importantly here, especially in the context that we see in Philippians chapter three, he's talking about the good things that he's done. He's going to list for us all his good works, all how how he he's got more reason to boast than anybody else that would be reading this letter or that would come to him and say, well, I'm a good religious man. I'm a good Jewish man. I'm from the right stock. I'm from the he's going to list his credentials as he's done in other places. And he's going to say, I'm going to count all that as just dumb. And I'm going to forget what's behind. me. You can't live on. You know what? I Yesterday. I did something wonderful for the Lord. You know, you forget what's behind you. If we're going to forget all the bad things, then we need to forget all the good things too. And when I say that, it sounds, it doesn't sound as pleasing as it does when I say forget the sin, does it? It doesn't sound as, as uh, warm and, and, and good feelings in my heart. Because what we want to do is we want to live on what happened last year. You know, last year I did a lot of good ministry. Last year, I did a lot of, you know, whatever it is that you did. You know, I did a lot of helping folks. I did a lot of praying. I did a lot of whatever. And so, you know what? I've done my duty. I've done my job. I've had my, I've had my, you know, I, I've been doing really, really good. And so I deserve a break today. You know, is that McDonald's? I deserve a break today. I deserve to take it, take it easy. I deserve to let somebody else take the reins for a while. That's not what Paul said. Uh, there is a certain sense and there's this slogan that's around that says what we just need to do is let go and let God. 
And there's a sense in which that's true. You know, we don't work for our salvation. We don't strive for our salvation. We just fall back into his arms and let him just uh, save us, let him change us. But when it comes to living the Christian life, when it comes to serving Christ, when it comes to loving each other, that's not true. Paul didn't say, I let go and I let God. He said, I strive. I strive for the prize. I reach for the prize. I stretch myself. That's the language he's going to use. That's what the sermon we heard the other night about stretching yourself. That's exactly what he says he's doing. I'm not just relaxing and letting, letting everything just fall with it. I'm straining for that prize. I'm stretching myself. I'm chasing after it with all that I have. It's almost like he says, the only focus I have in life. I'm forgetting everything that's around me. I'm forgetting everything that's behind me. The only focus I have in life is what's in front of me, the prize of the high calling, the, to make me like Jesus. I'm straining and striving and stretching and pursuing what Christ has for me. And so this is, of course, it's very familiar. Paul is the best of the best. You can't find a better one to save the Lord Jesus. In, in scripture, he started churches. He was from the stock that you're supposed to be from the tribe of Benjamin. And he lists all his accomplishments. And he does that in the beginning of chapter three. But look at verse seven. Let me just read seven through 11. I'm not going to stop there because I'm going to preach on the text a little later. <clears throat> but just let me read it to you. It says, verse seven says, but what things were gained to me, the things that counted for me, the things that were on my account. He said, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, just from knowing Jesus. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. I, I save you the save you the Greek lesson, but in, in, the, in, the, in Greek, if I were to use that word, dung that's translated dung it would be you would probably be like they they need to wash that boy's mouth out with soap i mean it was a bad it was a bad word it was a word that was offensive it was it was it was exactly what it means you know what dung is right now imagine if i used a word for dung that was you know uh, my my mom used to get on to me. She would say, you're not supposed to say ain't and all those things. She would listen to uh, Sunday school lessons and she would listen to me preach and stuff. She said, son, you got to work on your speaking. I mean, you ain't and done did and all this stuff. You can't be you can't be doing this. And I, I there was a few times I used to say the the word for dung, but it starts with a C, you know, and I'm, I'm not even going to say it now, but she said, you can't say that. You can't say stuff like that. Well, this word here would be worse than that. It was, he was intentionally being offensive. All that stuff that I did good, that's just yeah. st- stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's dung. It's dung. I, I, it would have been, it, people reading this would have been like, dang, you're not supposed to talk like that. You're not supposed to use them kind of words. He purposefully did it so it would be offensive. There is nothing. He's saying here, there is nothing that is more important in this life than my relationship with Christ. And anything that I put in it is just dumb. There's nothing that's more important. Now, when I say that, all of y'all can agree with me. You can say, you know, you know, I'm right. You know that that's what Paul is saying. You, we, there's, there's not any, I, I know that there right now, all, all of y'all that are listening to me, y'all know for a fact that that's right. You know, that is what he is saying. There's nothing more important than the knowledge, the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, nothing more important. But what I want you to see, I don't have, y'all don't, y'all don't need me to convince you of that. What I want you to see, what you need me to convince you of, what we need to see that Paul is saying here, it's not just important, it's urgent. There's a difference. There's a difference between something that's important and something that's urgent. Important things, there are all kind of important things in this life that you need to do, that I need to do. You know, you you need to spend time with your family. That's important. You need to get things done that need to get done. That's important. But there are other things in this life that are urgent. It's got to be done right now. 
It's got to be done right now before you leave the building today. It's got to be done before I, before I step foot to in the house at the end of the day uh, to, to wrap up my day and to go to bed and get ready for tomorrow. There's some things that are urgent. They got to be done. It's got to be done. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that's necessary. As I was, I was thinking about this yesterday and praying on this yesterday, um, Jesse came in the, in, in the room. He said, hey, will you throw the football with me? And I said, no, I can't right now. I'm, I'm working on sermon for tomorrow. I'm, I'm busy. And then so I, I, I'm doing, you know, studying and praying and, and, and writing things down. And I hear him out there with the football, throwing it up on the roof and catching it. And I was right here thinking about what's important and what's urgent. And here and that was the perfect example. It's important for me to get out there and throw the football with him. But. It was urgent at the time that I had to get this stuff done. So you know what I did? I took, t- I took 15 minutes and stopped what I was doing, and I went out and threw the football with him because that was important. But this relationship with Christ, striving and straining to be more like Christ, to, to develop your relationship, it's not just important. It's, all, it's both. It's important and it's urgent. It's not something that you can, you know, and I'm going to get to that. So often we do that. I mean, we, you know what it takes to develop your relationship with Christ. You know what it takes to be more like Christ. It takes the grace and the power of God. It takes the spirit of God working in your life. And you, you access that, that power by coming to him, where, whether it's coming to him in your Bible study or coming to him in, in prayer or coming to him in the fellowship of the saints or, or coming to him in all the ways that he's designed for us to come to him. That's how you develop that relationship with him. That's how you know him more. That's how you come into his presence. That's how more and more of your sin is revealed and more and more of his holiness is revealed. And you start to understand more and more of this grace. But so often we say, you know what? I'll come and pray. I'll come and read. I'll come and whatever. Once I get all my other stuff done. Once I get, you know, have you, have you read your Bible any this week? I just hadn't had time. Is it important? Yeah, of course it's important, but it's not urgent. It's not urgent to us. You, this is something that I need. It's something that I feed on. If it was like, it's like the Bible says that his word is, is what we feast on. It's what grows us. It's, it, it, we're not, we're not, uh, we don't live by bread alone. We live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. We live by this word. None of us, especially me, is going to be skipping any meals. None, I, I, I'm never going to say, you know what? I'm just so busy. I didn't get a chance to eat today. No, I'm going to make time. I promise you, I'm going to make time to eat. I'm going to make, when that stomach starts growling and I start feeling bad, it starts feeling like my backbone's dissolving because my stomach's eating it. I'm going to make time to eat. I'm going to make time. Understand that that's what Paul is saying here. It's urgent. It's urgent. He says, where did I get to? He says, uh, count them as dung that I lost of all things. Where is it at? Come on, y'all. Where did I, where did I get to? Verse nine and be found in him. That's what he wants found in him, not having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. This is the reason so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. If by any means I attain unto the resurrection of the dead. You see what he says? By any means. It's not just important to him. It's urgent. I got to have it right now. I don't want any of this stuff added to my account. I'm not looking back last year and seeing how good I did, whether I did good in in ministry or whether I did good in service or whether I did good. Can you imagine what kind of people we would be if you woke up every day? Now, you know that when you wake up every day, God's mercies are new every morning, right? And that his grace is new and it's sufficient. And all you have to do is you have to confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's first John one nine. You realize that we get up and that's how we should think. God's mercies are new every morning. His grace is new every morning. But what if you got up every morning and you said, you know what? Today's a new day. I have done absolutely nothing for Christ. 
You forgot all the stuff you did yesterday and you started every morning. Not only is his grace new and his mercy is new, but my service to him is new this morning. <clears throat> how, how would we approach God if we came to him and we knew that we had, ever, we had never done anything for him? Never done anything. I haven't done any service for you. I haven't done any, I mean, I haven't done anything yet. I'm, I'm a recipient of your grace, recipient of your mercy. Uh, uh, all this you've given me for no reason other than you just cause you love me. I'm a, uh, when we were yet sinners, he came and died for us and no reason at all. He came and he saved me and I woke up this morning and I've done nothing. I've done nothing for him. <clears throat> That's not how we live though, is it? I, yesterday I did pretty good. Day before that I did pretty good. Last year I can go back and I can see all these good things that I've done. All these what God must be proud of me. Paul said, "Look, what's behind me? I, I'm not even going to think about. It. I'm going to forget that. We're going to we're going to forget what what happens is we start remembering the stuff we're supposed to be forgetting, and we start forgetting the stuff that we're supposed to be remembering." He says, look, I'm remembering the fact that all I want is Christ. All I want on my account is Christ. I'm going to just strive for the goal just so I can be known and I can know him in the power of his resurrection and I can be conformable to his death and I can be a participant with his sufferings and all that stuff that's supposedly on my account, all that stuff that the world looks at and says, wow, you're doing a good job. You're not as bad as all them other people. All of my lineage, all of my raising, all the things that would say, wow, you're a pretty good person. I'm going to forget all that. I'm going to count all that as just dumb. Boy, I wish I could use that other word. It would shock you. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to do. It would shock you. It's just dumb. He says, by any means, by any means necessary that I might attain the resurrection of the dead. I'm, I, I'm going to, I'm going to let go of all of that stuff. And it's an urgent thing. It's not just important. It is important, but it's urgent. It's a right now. Paul would not say, you know what? I got, I got time. <clears throat> I'm a little busy today. I got things I got going on. You don't understand. You know, I'm making tents. Uh, you know, Paul was a tent maker and yeah, I, I'm doing all this other stuff. Just give me a minute and I, I'll, I'll get busy with this in just a second. I got to get this other stuff done. Paul would never say that. It was an urgent thing. It was a right now. It was, a, I've got to get it done right now before anything else. This is what I live for. This is what I strive for. This is the focus of my life. If I let this go by the wayside and start focusing on something else, start doing something else, start living for something else, no matter what it is, whether it be money or fun or comfort or ease or, or success, or you just, just name it, whatever. He would never say, you know, I'm going to let this just kind of go by the wayside a little bit. And I'm going to start focusing on this because I got to get this done. You know, I know this is still important. It's still important to seek Christ. It's still important to live for Christ. Still important to do all those things. But right now I'm just kind of focusing on something else so I can get this out of the way. He would never say that. He says, look, everything, everything around, everything that that presents itself as important in my life next to Christ, next to living for Christ, next to straining and striving to develop that relationship, to get closer to God, to to be closer to him, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next to that, all that other is just it's just crap. It's dumb. It's not worth anything. Paul, Paul for, wants to forget all those things and he wants to remember what he's here for. In verse 12, he remembers that he's, he's not a perfect man. He says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He knows that he knows that he hasn't arrived. Did you know that there are some people, there's a group out there, you know, uh, 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 it's, they got na- they got a name for them, but they would say that they're perfect. Not perfect in Christ. We know that we are perfect in Christ, but I'm talking about perfect in, I, you know, I heard one guy say I ain't sinned in three years. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's like, well, yeah, let me ask your wife. (laughs) 
if you ain't sinning three years. Paul's not saying, he's like, look, as good as he was, I mean, as good, when I say as good as he was, I mean, can you, anybody, can you imagine being the kind of servant that he was? He was started all these different churches, spent his whole life traveling, uh, preaching the gospel. When he wrote this, he had been a Christian for 30 years. He had started all kind of churches. He had been beaten for Christ. He had been persecuted for Christ. He had endured all these things for Christ. He had, you know, preached the gospel and done all these things for Christ. And even now, after all this time, all he's done, he said, look, I, I hadn't attained. I, I'm not already made perfect. He said, but what I do is, he says, what I do is, I strive for the goal. It says in verse 12, he says, I follow after. That's, that's not just with your hands in your pocket whistling. This is the way I'm going. It's all good. I'm going to follow this thing. No, no. It, it, it's, a, it's a straining and a striving and a, and a, a stretching yourself, a yearning. It, it, it's like a, a, a runner who's trying to reach that line before the other guy. He's, he's putting everything that he has in it. That's what, that's what the word means. It's not just a strolling along in the park, you know, and I'm following after this thing. No, he's saying, he's saying I haven't already attained what I'm seeking. What I'm seeking is I want to be like Jesus. That's what he's going to say here in a minute. He said, I want to be like Jesus. Jesus has made me perfect in the eyes of the Father. There's nothing more that can be added, nothing more that can be done. I can't add to it with any good work. I can't take away from it with any bad work. In the eyes of the Father, I am perfect in Christ. When I stand before him, the only thing that will be shown on the screen of my life is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But in my flesh, in this cursed world, in this fallen state that we're still in, I'm not perfect yet. I'm not like Jesus yet. I'm still growing. And that I am seeking after that. I am chasing. If you've ever heard me say following hard after God or, or, or chasing after Christ, this is where I get it from. This is the language that he used. I am chasing that thing with single minded devotion. I'm not looking at anything else. I'm not looking at anything around me. I'm not turning around and watching the guy that's chasing me. <clears throat> there was a race that a long, long time ago where, uh, the, you know, a foot race where I think it was, you know, hundred meters or 400 meters or whatever. And the guy was running and he was almost there, but the crowd was roaring and he couldn't hear the guy's footsteps behind him. So he turned around to look as he was running and that gave the other guy just enough speed to pass him. To pass him and win the race. <clears throat> Paul says, I'm not looking behind me. I'm not changing my focus. I'm not, I'm not <clears throat> letting anything deviate my mind, my focus, my heart, my service from following after Christ, from trying to grab a hold of what has grabbed a hold of me. That's the language that he uses. He says, Jesus has done all the work. <clears throat> He's came and he's seized me. He's apprehended me. He's grabbed me. He's done all the work. He has made me into what I need to be to stand before God. He's, he's done that. He's grabbed a hold of me. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to grab hold of this thing that has grabbed a hold of me. I'm going to spend the rest of my life focusing in, targeting in on that goal and, and trying to be who he's already made me to be. I want to be on the outside what Jesus has made me already on the inside. <clears throat> he says, I'm going to spend the rest of my life focusing on that goal. In verse, uh, where are we at, 12? He says, I haven't already attained it. He says, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended. And so he says, verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I haven't got it yet. He says, but this one thing that I do, this one thing, forgetting those things which are behind. This is what we're supposed to forget. Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark. For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. He says, I press toward. I mean, that's a resolution for you. If you want to make a resolution this year, <clears throat> I'm going to forget everything. 
I'm going to forget everything that's behind me and I'm going to pr- I'm going to press on. I'm going to I'm going to chase after the mark of the high calling. <clears throat> God has called me to his salvation. Do you know so many times we've heard and it's so true that you just can't you didn't just come and get saved whenever you just you know what? I think I'm going to get ready. I'm going to just go and get saved. If you know, maybe the mo- you got saved when the Holy Spirit drew you. You got saved when the Holy Spirit called you. You got saved when God, it's not just like, it's not just like a blanket that's thrown out over, you know, over and saying, you know what? Here it is. All y'all come on with you. No, the Holy Spirit comes to you individually as the preaching of the gospel goes forth. And he, he takes that gospel and he binds that gospel in your heart and, and convicts you of your sin and says, you, I'm calling you. I, I'm talking to you. It's a personal thing. You know, the same, the same gospel message, Brother Eddie can stand up here and preach and it'd be just one message. He's preaching one message. A guy over here playing on his phone, the whole service. And a guy over here, the Holy Spirit is just like, oh no, I need to be saved. You know, the Holy Spirit comes to, comes to you individually and he calls you. He said, that thing has happened. He said, I'm going to spend my life chasing that mark, that mark of the calling that God has put on my life. He's put a calling upon your life if you have if you have the Holy Spirit indwelled in you, if you are saved, if you are are redeemed, Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, I'll come in and I'll sup with you and 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 we'll be in you and with you and I'll be with you to the end of the age. You have a calling upon your life and that is to follow me, to pick up your cross, deny yourself and to follow Christ. And he said, Paul said, look, I'm going to forget everything. That's behind me. I'm going to forget everything that I've ever done. All that, you know, Paul was a murderer, right? He was killing and and, and putting Christians in prison and all this. I'm going to forget all that. I'm going to put all that behind me. All my failures, all the things that I should have done that I couldn't do, all the things that I I think back and I say, you know what? You'll never be what God wants you to be because you've got all this mess. You've got all this mess that you're tagging around with you. He said, I forget all that. But also I forget all the good things. I forget all the things that I've done that were good, that were righteous and all those things. Yes, God's going to reward you for your work. Yes, but I don't live in what I did two years ago. I don't live in what I did a year ago. I don't live in what I did last week. I live in what's right in front of me. I press toward the mark of the high calling. I press toward to grab a hold of what has grabbed a hold of me. I am made like Christ on the inside. My heart is is new. And when God looks at me, all he sees is perfection and righteousness. The righteousness that I didn't deserve. The righteousness that Jesus gave me. But I am striving to be on the outside what he's already made me on the inside. I'm straining to to serve him. To live for him. to, To be who he has for me to be. And that's what I'm, that's the mark. That's the reason why, that's the reason why you're here. You know, he didn't save you just so you could be saved and then live out the rest of your life saved. He saved you so that you could be a witness for him and that you could be, you could be, you would be a servant for him. He says, for, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourself, lest any man should, should boast. He says, but you're saved, in that same verse, you're saved, it's Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. You're saved unto good works. For you are God's workmanship, created unto good works, that he has ordained that you walk in them. He created, he recreated you, he saved you. So that you would grow in him and be a witness in him. If, if, if it wasn't for that, I mean, he, he could have just miracled you on up to heaven. He could have just beamed you up and, you know, we get out of this sinful world, get out of all this stuff. He left us here because he says, you will be my witnesses. You will be my spokesmen. You will be my ambassadors. You will be. And Paul says, look, I'm, I'm leaving all that stuff behind. I'm leaving all the stuff that I've done good, all the stuff that I've done bad. The context of this passage is talking about good things. If you go all the way back to verse one, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But he says, he says, 
verse four says, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think he hath whereof might trust in the flesh, I more. And then he goes on to list all the things that he has. He could boast in. You know, I've been circumcised on the eighth day. I'm from the stock of whatever I've I've done all these things. He was the man. He says, but I'm forgetting all that. I'm counting all that is done. I'm passing all that. I'm leaving all that. And I'm chasing after Christ. I'm chasing after who he is. <clears throat> and finally, it says in verse 15, then this is where we'll stop. <clears throat> he says, I'm going to be chasing this thing. I'm going to be pressing toward the mark. I'm going to be moving toward the goal that he set before me. And then he says in verse 15, <clears throat> the command for us. He says, let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, perfect in Christ, be thus minded. And if anything... And if anything, ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. He said, listen, if you have been perfected in Christ, if you remember, we said that if Christ has saved you in the eyes of the father, you're perfect. You've been given salvation. You've been given grace. You've been given righteousness that doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Christ. You've been given perfection. He says, but if you're perfect in Christ, then you're going to have this mindset about you. You're going to be this, you're going to be thinking this way. The man who says, I am perfect in Christ, therefore I'm going to sit back and eat, drink and be merry and live my life. That is a creature that is not found in scripture. That is a, that is a person that the New Testament doesn't know anything about is it, when it talks about Christians. It says that since we have this hope in us, we're going to be purifying ourselves. Since we have the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> Titus 2, 11 and 12, the Holy Spirit, that, that the grace that brings salvation, it teaches us to lay aside God, ungodliness and unrighteousness, to live presently in this present world, to live righteously godly in this present world. Over and over again, it says those who have been perfected will be chasing after perfection. Those who have been changed, those have been made perfect, will be following after what Christ has for them. Will be uh, when they do step off the path and step off and try to do something else. The Holy Spirit will come and chastise them. It will come. He will come and and, and dis- discipline them. He will come and bring them back and say, "No, you're going the wrong direction." It's just a fact. It's just a fact. I could say we're talking about all these diets and all these things. I can't read your hearts. I can't know anything about your salvation other than what, you know, what I see and what I think, which is fallible. All I can know about is me. But think about this. If I told you, if I told you, you know what, I'm going on a diet. I made a New Year's resolution and here's my diet that I'm going to lose weight by 2017. I'm going to lose weight and all I'm going to eat is Oreos and Coke all day long, every day. You don't know my heart, but you could pretty well tell that I really hadn't made up my mind I was going to lose weight. Because that's not, that's, not the, that's not the path that someone who wants to lose weight takes. So the person who says, you know what, I, I love Jesus and I'm all about this thing. And I, yeah, oh yeah, you can't tell me, you can't tell me that I'm not a Christian. But there is no evidence at all in their life that they are seeking after Christ, serving Christ, following Christ. Yes, you might believe all the truths that are there. You might believe that there was a man named Jesus and he was God's son and he did die on a cross. No problem. You can believe all those things. But if there's no evidence in your life that you're chasing after this thing, no evidence in your life that you're following, no evidence in your life that there's this tug, this high calling upon your life that you are striving for, You don't have any reason whatsoever to be assured of anything. You don't have any reason. You have no evidence. There is no good reason why you should say, I know that I'm a Christian. Just because you believe there was a Jesus and he died on the cross. That's not what the Bible says a Christian is. That's not what the Bible says God will do in the hearts of his people. If you cannot believe that God says I will cause you to keep my commandments. I will change you from this creature to that creature. I will cause you to walk after my statutes. If you can't believe that, you don't have any business believing John 3.16 either. 
Because it's all true. Every jot, every tittle, every word, every promise God's make, God made is true. And when, when I say promise, we all think of, I'm going to do this for you and I'm going to do that for you. Those are promises and those are all true. But God also says, I am going to make you into the man, the woman, the person that I want you to be. And if that's not taking place, then you have no assurance whatsoever. No matter what you say, no matter what you affirm. Paul said, I am going to be chasing after that thing. I'm going to be chasing after that thing that has caught a hold of me. I'm going to be chasing after this salvation. In 2016, if that's not you, it's going to be revealed to you. That's what it said right there. The last thing we read and we'll close it says, and if, if, in, if in anything you be other mind, otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this to you. He's going to reveal it to you. And then the choice is going to be yours. <clears throat> For some of y'all, he has already revealed it to you and is revealing it to you. And you've held on to this idea that, you know, whatever, because I, because I believe a set of facts that makes me okay with God. Some of you, he's revealed it to you. And you know what? I just can't, I can't walk out in front of all them people. I haven't been here too long. I, didn't, I mean, what would they think? I mean, what would they, what would they, what would they say? He's already revealed it to you. You know, in 2016, I thought it's just, maybe it's just time for those riding the fence just to go on. Maybe. I mean, maybe it's time for those who just refuse to fellowship with God's people to go on. I'm not saying go on. I'm saying maybe it's time for them to go on. Maybe it'll be to go on. All of you guys are chasing something. Everybody's chasing something. Whatever it is. Might be comfort. Might be ease. Might be security. Might be, well, you know, whatever. You got, you are chasing after something. Paul said, the only thing I'm chasing is Jesus. The only thing I'm chasing is to be like Christ. And anything else is idolatry. And so today, <clears throat> before, you know, I don't know what kind of resolutions you done made. Maybe you ain't made none. I really ain't. I really didn't make any either. But there's one that we need to make. Need to make it today that I'm going to forget everything that's behind me. I'm going to forget all, how bad I messed up. Maybe you just, maybe 2015 was the worst year you ever lived. I'm going to forget all that. Maybe 2015 saw you doing some of the greatest things you've ever done. I'm going to forget all that. And starting at this moment, I can't do nothing about 10 minutes ago. Starting at this moment, I'm going to press toward the goal of the high calling. I'm going to press toward the mark. I'm going to try to grab hold in my life of what has already grabbed hold of my heart. And I'm going to, I'm going to strive for him. I'm going to strive for to know him more, to be more like him, to let him change me more. I'm going to str- I'm going to lay down everything that I have, pick up my cross, and I'm going to follow him. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word, God.